here's the specific story, specific actionable item to get money chasing you. By the way, in this world of private money, we don't chase, we don't beg, we don't sell, we don't persuade. I've never even asked anybody for money. They're, they're chasing me, they're gonna chase you. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Conner. Here's the... Welcome, guys. Today, we have a great guest, and we're talking all about raising private money. Uh, but before we get into that, How's it going, Mason? It's going well. Uh, today's show was a ton of fun and I think extraordinarily relevant to everything that we've been doing in our individual businesses, as well as with Ground Up Fund, which just launched this month in June of 2024. Yeah, no, it's exciting. Uh, we've been talking about this and working on it for really over a year now. And uh, so this was very appropriate timing wise. So today we had Jake Connor on the show and Mason and I know him because We've both been on his podcast, Raising Private Money, and I, I like talking to Jay because he's been doing this since 2009. So he's, I think I was in seventh grade in 2009, so he's been around, and he has done over 475 house flips, which is just crazy to think about. And so he has a seven-figure business that's very effectively automated, flipping homes, and he's financing everything via private money. So he lost all of his lines of credit at the bank in 2009, as just about everyone did. And that's when he realized he had to go figure out how to raise money on his own. So that's his expertise, uh, serious house flipper and raiser of private money. And so we're going to bring him in and talk some actionable steps of how you can go and do the same. Mr. Jay Connor, how are you doing today? Oh, my lands, Mason. How am I doing today? I'm like so excited to be on here with your all's show, you and Dan, to talk about my most favorite subject, that being private money, because private money's had more of an impact on mine and Carol George real estate investing business than any other strategy that we have employed. I've never missed out on a deal since 2009 because I got the private money, and I'm excited to share how in the world, what it is, and how it works. Heck yeah. That, I mean, that's a perfect intro and it, it's a perfect segue to our first question, which is, you know, Dan and I, we think it's important to not put the cart before the horse. And have you ever run into the issue of having more capital available than deals to deploy them into? All the time. Isn't that a good problem? <laughs> so it's like, you know, I've got 47 private lenders I guess, first of all, it would be a good idea for to define what we mean by private lenders. The Absolutely. laws in recent times, hard money lenders and the hard money space, which, by the way, no disrespect to hard money lenders. Some of my best friends on the planet are hard money lenders, high integrity. In fact, I, I could name quite a few of them. And I say have as many relationships with people as you can, right? Have as many relationships as you can. Uh, however, at the same time, when I'm there's a, there's a trend, okay? There's a trend in the hard money lending space that is trying to replace the word or phrase hard money lender to private money lender, and they are not the same thing. A private money lender, uh, by its simple foundational definition is an individual. It's a human being like you and me that loans money from their investment capital and or their retirement funds to the real estate investor. There's no middle person involved. That's why there's no origination fees or points because there's no broker or middle or there's nobody originating the loan to be paid an origination fee. So when we say private money, we're talking about doing business with another individual it's going to loan us, the real estate investor, uh, the um, you know either from their investment capital or retirement funds. But now, since I gave the definition of what a private money lender really is, I forgot your first question, which was, 
it, it was just about having more de- or more money than deals to actually deploy. Yeah. yeah. So Carol Joy, my wife and I, we have 47 private lenders, um, which tallies up to about eight and a half million dollars in private money that these 47 private lenders have. They have from $50,000 each to over a million dollars each uh, and, you know, everything in between. And so, yes, ever since, I mean, it's a good problem, but quite frankly, it is a juggling act on being able to deploy. And because here's what's going to happen. If you're, li- if you're listening to this show and you haven't raised any private money yet, you're, and you do it my way, you're going to have a good problem. And that is you'll have actually more money than you can put to use. Um, that's why when I have a new private lender come into our world, I use their money first because I, I mean, next, I use their money next on the next deal. Cause I want to prove that to them that I can actually perform and you know, that I'm doing deals. One of the first questions a new private lender is going to ask you is how, how soon can you put my money to work? Because you're not going to borrow the money until you got a deal, right? Do not borrow the money unless you got a deal with security. The SEC frowns on that greatly, right? So we want to secure that note. Um, and so you need to be prepared to answer that question. So what I do is I, I use a prior. In fact, sometimes in the past when I have a new private lender come on board, if I don't have a deal coming right around the corner, I will sometimes use that new private money to pay off a current private lender and refinance that property so I can prove right away that I can I can put that money to work. So when I pay off a private lender and we cash out, as we call it, on a deal, then that available private money now goes into what I call the queue. The queue. Well, what in the world is the queue? Well, it's not any kind of fancy software. It's actually an Excel spreadsheet is all it is. And so we put that private lender back in the queue and we paid off, say, for example, a $200,000 private lender note, that $200,000, and the name of that private lender goes to the bottom of the list. And now they just work their way up until we have another deal. Now, let's say that we've got a deal coming along and and, and ahead of that $200,000 that that came available that we just paid off on a real estate deal. Well, let's say the only private lenders above them have smaller amounts of money, only 50000 or or 100000 I use smaller amounts of money for rehabbing projects. You know, you can have more than one private lender uh, secured by the same deal as long as the total loan to value does not exceed 75% of the after-repaired value. So if I pay off $200,000 on a deal and now that private lender goes in the queue with 200000 well, let's say the only private lenders that are above them are, you know, less than 200000 Well, I use larger amounts of money for purchasing properties. So that $200,000 lender is going to jump above to the next deal uh, for those that only have like 50000 available or say 75000 available. But uh, does that make sense? It, it absolutely does. And Jay, a Good amount to unpack and a ton of follow-up questions for that. Um, But backing up just one second, I think it was important to make that definition and different uh, distinguish between the private lender and the hard money lender where a hard money lender, they have private lenders that they go raise money from and then they deploy that capital and they take the spread in between. It's just debt arbitrage, which is a really fantastic model. It's what banks do. It's what hard money lenders do. It's what uh, tons and tons and tons of people do out there. Uh, but that being said, being able to have access to those private lenders, it ends up saving you a good amount of money because depending on who you are and how the deal is structured, those origination points or what that interest amount can be can actually kill the deal whenever uh, it would pro forma out just on a cash basis. But Jay, talking. I, I was just going to say. I was just going to say real quick, uh, Mason. Uh, j- j- let's give, uh, if it's okay, let me share some specifics as to what you just said about. You know, you're going to pay the hard money lender a whole lot more money than you are the private lender. So let me give you the specifics. So I pay my private lenders eight percent, eight percent. That's what I've been paying them eight percent since 2009, and it hadn't changed. In fact, and I get to go ahead. And Jay, on that eight percent. 
of is that eight percent annualized or is it eight percent cash on cash return or how how is that structured with your lenders? Yeah, that's an um, an annual percentage rate APR. So if I borrow for easy figuring a hundred thousand dollars and I'm paying eight percent, if I use that hundred thousand dollars for an entire year, then I'm paying eight thousand dollars in interest, not compounded interest, simple interest. Perfect. Now let's say I use that hundred thousand dollars for only six months. Then eight percent annualized means if I'm using a hundred thousand dollars for six months, they're gonna get paid four thousand dollars, right? In interest. So it's for the amount of time that I use the money. So back to the contrast between hard money, the real cost of hard money, and a private lender. Well, with a private lender, there's no origination fees, there's no extension fees, there's no junk fees, there's no appraisal cost, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the only money you're going to be paying your private lender is the interest rate, right? In my case, 8%. Now, contrast that to hard money. Um, You know, this side of COVID, uh, shoot, when COVID came along, hard money lenders actually shut down. As recent as last year, I've got a friend who works for a hard money lender. And as recent as last year, unless you had a 720 credit score, they wouldn't even talk to you. Uh, In this world of private money, your credit score has got nothing to do with how much private money you can get. I've never had a private money lender even ask what my credit score is or or want to see a copy of my credit report, etc., so your credit's got nothing to do with it. But as far as what we're, you know, hard money lenders, I know hard money lenders right now that are getting paid 11.99%. You might as well call it 12%. I know others that are at 14%. Um, I don't know any that are less than 10 right now. Maybe there's some out there. I don't know. But so let's say, let's say the average is right now 12%. Let's just say 12%. If you're brand new, it's going to be more than that. Uh, but if it's 12%, you're going to pay 12% the, uh, uh, for hard money. The origination fee is going to be somewhere between 2 and 4% when you add it all up. But let's just say it's 2%. Well, now you're at 14%. And then you've got, um, you know, close, uh, you've got, uh, you know, other types of fees. So it might be 15%. And then here's another one. If you don't cash out within the six months or nine months, most hard money lenders are going to be either six months or nine months on the length of the note, then they will probably extend your note. But of course, what do they want? More money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's big called an extension fee. Yeah. Uh, say what, Dan? Well, big, big extension fees. I've seen this happen. Extension fees. Yeah. 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 So I've got a friend who's a hard money lender. In fact, I got some friends who are hard money lenders that use my strategies to raise hard money. I mean, private money for their own hard money fund, right? Which is, I mean, it's all the same money. Are you going to use it for your own real estate deals? Or are you going to use it to loan money out to other real estate investors and have a fund? But I've got a good friend who's a hard money lender that if you haven't cashed out or paid off that note uh, within the term uh, limit of that note, they will extend your note, but they charge 3% for 90 more days. 3%. So if you borrowed $100,000, another 3000 Again, uh, I'm, I'm not knocking hard money lenders at all. I'm just pointing out the differences in the contrast. And quite frankly, at the end of the day, the access to the money is actually more important than exactly what you're going to be paying unless... You're going to be holding that thing for six months or nine months because I tell you what, that money can add up fast. So in contrast between the two, another big difference is how much are you going to be advanced at purchase price? That's a huge difference. You know, if you're borrowing hard money, uh, they're going to loan you either 65% to 80% typically of the purchase price. Well, you got to come up with the rest of that money, right, when you when you purchase the property. In this world of private money, um, you're going to get 100% of your purchase price. If there's a rehab involved, you're going to get 100% of the rehab money up front. Um, and, you're, and here's a good double check. So here's a writer downer. This is worth writing down 
unless you're driving. If you're driving, don't write it down. Come back and listen again. But here's a writer downer, and this is a good double check. If you can't, if you're doing private money, borrowing private money the way I do, if you can't bring home a check at purchase when you close and not take any of your own money to the closing table, you should not do the deal. You should yeah. not do the deal. Because that means, by the way, we're borrowing a maximum of 75% of the after-repaired value. I didn't say 75% of the purchase price. If you do that, you got to bring 25% of purchase price to the closing table when you buy. But 75% of after-repaired value, well, the way you're going to bring home a big check when you purchase is if you're buying at a substantial discount on the property, and if you are borrowing on loan to value based on after repaired value and not on purchase. We well, see all 47 of my private lenders advance to me 100% of purchase, 100% of the rehab money, and even some additional equity based on the after repaired value. So I always bring home a big check. I mean, here's the question. Who wants to get paid to buy properties? Who wants to bring home a big check? My real estate attorney, Julie Wickheiser, whose office is right next door, by the way, that's convenient. Uh, the phrase on her check that I love, that I when I pick up a check when I buy, is excess cash to close. And I love me some excess cash. There we go. I, I love it. I love it. And Jay, you're providing a master class on the difference between hard and private money. And I think diving even deeper into private money before I pass it off to Dan uh, to ask some follow-up questions that he has burning is whenever you're raising this private money, uh, it seems like for the most part, it's a deal by deal basis of you matching an individual investor up with a deal. Sometimes, sometimes you maybe have them provide the capital to purchase the the house or the asset and another one to finance the rehab of it. Are you doing this as secured or unsecured promissory notes? That's a great question. And I'm glad you brought it up. This is so important. I always borrow and I encourage you that is listening to this show always secure that money. Do not borrow unsecured money, for goodness sakes. First of all, there's a good chance you just might get a knock on your door from the SEC when you borrow unsecured funds. They don't like that very much, right? But when you are borrowing uh, funds, either investment capital and or retirement funds, and they've moved it over to a self-directed IRA to loan it out to you. By the way, that was a big uh, mic drop I just said right there. You need to have a relationship with a self-directed IRA company that you can refer your new potential private lenders that you have put on your teacher hat and told them about what private money is. So you can, re you can introduce them to your rep at the self-directed IRA company, and they can move their retirement funds over. But back to securing funds. Everything we do, now, my world is primarily single-family homes. That's my world, single-family homes. But if you're into multifamily and small apartments or duplexes, triplexes, or big apartments, uh, it's all the same money. It's all the same money. It's just how you structure it. So in this world of single-family homes, we always secure the promissory note with, in North Carolina, it's called a deed of trust. Most states, it's called a mortgage, and most people, even in North Carolina, call it a mortgage. It's actually a deed of trust. It accomplishes the same thing. It collateralizes the note, which means if you don't pay the lender, your private lender, then they have the legal right to foreclose on that property. Sometimes I'll have new real estate investors say to me, uh, Mason and Dan, new real estate investors will say, who in the world is going to loan me money and I've never done a deal? Who's going to loan me money? I've never done a deal. Here's the answer. And this would be the new real estate investor talking to the private lender. And here is exactly what you would say. It's real simple. If I don't pay you, the property does. If I don't pay you, the property does, which means if you don't pay the private lender that loans you the money, they get the property. And based off of our criteria as to how the maximum loan amount that we borrow, they'll actually make more money 
than with the property than the interest you would have paid them. But they don't want to mess with the property, for goodness sakes. They just want you to pay them their interest. Back to your question, Mason. So you want to secure the note with a deed of trust or mortgage. And, of course, your real estate attorney is going to draw up the documents for you to do this. And so here's another writer downer. In this world of single-family homes and private money, all the deals we do are called one-offs. One-offs. And with them being one-offs, I'm going to explain what that means. A one-off means you're not regulated by the SEC, the Security Exchange Commission. You're not raising money for a fund. Like if you're going to be doing an apartment deal or, you know, a much larger deal, then you would establish a private placement, right? And you'd have a fund established and an SEC attorney would draw up all that. Well, that's not this world of single-family houses. When I say one-offs, here's what I mean. A one-off means you've got a property, a single-family property. Now, it could be a duplex, triplex, or quadplex. You've got a property, right, with a physical address. And now you're going to have a private lender or maybe two or three private lenders. You can have more than one private lender secured by the same property, but they have their own promissory note and their own mortgage or deed of trust. And so one-offs, a private lender or a few private lenders that are being secured by that property. It's a one-off. And guess what? You're not limited to borrowing from accredited investors. You can borrow from anybody. It, they don't have to be accredited when you're doing these one-offs. Gotcha. No, that's helpful, Jay. Thanks for going into detail there. And Mason and I can certainly speak to uh, uh, going through that process with an SEC attorney as we just finished that for our fund, uh, for what we're doing, providing capital for land investors who need their land deals. So to that end, something I want to drill down on here. So you have almost four dozen investors you mentioned, and kind of to Mason's first question about how do you balance enough deals for the amount of capital you have? And if a couple of those investors or 10 of those investors have been waiting a year and you haven't brought them anything, they're probably going to go find somewhere else to put their money. And so, of course, with your model, you're not paying them interest as they're waiting. So how do you balance that where you keep all your four, almost four dozen investors happy, but then you're not over leveraging or taking on deals just because you have money to deploy? Can you speak a little more to that? Well, uh, yes, I can. Yes, I can. And here's the answer. Don't raise too much private money. <laughs> mm -hmm. sure. so, so I actually have an exercise in my brand new seven day private money challenge, brand new exercise that I have the members that enroll in the seven day private money challenge. And I teach them in that, in that, in one of the days of the challenge, I teach them how to figure their what I call their freedom number. Well, one of them was a freedom number. A freedom number is how much money do you need to be making every month to cover your existing expenses? In addition to that, how much money do you need to be bringing in per month to live the lifestyle you want, right? And so we go through this exercise of, first of all, you got to figure out, well, what lifestyle do you want, right? And then we figure out how much money you need to accomplish that. Then we figure out, okay, well, now how many deals per year at whatever average profit you need to do in order to make that money? And then once you know how many deals at the average profit per deal, that's going to tell you how much private money you need to raise within the next 12 months in order to accomplish and live the way you want to live. So first, you know, I can teach people all day long how to go, how to go raise a lot of private money. But the question is, how much private money do you really need in order to accomplish and do the number of deals that you want? So, um, and which reminds me, and Mason and Dan, I think we talked about this when I had you all on my podcast. Um, but for the, for the sake of the listeners on this show, I'm going to ask you all a question. Have you ever heard an educator, a mentor, a coach, ever say the following or give the following advice because it absolutely drives me nuts. I just want to go run face first in a brick wall every time I hear this. And have you ever heard somebody give the advice, 
Oh, just go get the deal under contract. The money will show up. Yeah, I've heard that. Many so, oh, yes. Why do they say that? I mean, it's like, is get the deal under contract. Is is, is the money just going to like rain out of clouds? Is the, is the money just going to show up and just sort of like, and, and here's another thing they'll say. They'll say, if the deal is good enough, the money will follow the deal. You ever heard that? Yes. The deal's good enough. The man. That's the most stupid thing I ever heard in my life. I mean, it just makes a lot more sense to me before I'm putting a deal under contract to know how I'm going to fund the deal. I was a guest on a podcast not too long ago. We were having this conversation, and the host of the podcast said, "I mean, I said I asked the po- the host. I said, why do they say that and give that kind of advice?" And uh, the host says, "Well, Jay, it's real simple." Um, the advice, the, 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 the educators that give the advice, they're selling a course on how to find deals and how to get deals on the contract. And they ain't going to teach you nothing about how to get it funded. <laughs> I, but I do think... you agree with my philosophy? You should have the money lined up first. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think it goes back to one, one comment you made of the value of being able to connect capital. And that's where, where and why hard money lenders are deserved. They they deserve to make the money on top of it. Because, Absolutely, because they've gone out and raised it. They deserve to make their money. Exactly, exactly. And so there's a ton of value in being able to connect capital to deals and take a spread. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Dan, I'm not sure I answered your question. Well, I mean, you gave a good idea, but I, I guess just how, you know how I, balancing that planning, you. You know, we we talked about it in the intro before you got on, but you've rehabbed and flipped a ton of houses. And so is it just a matter of really accurate forecasting of your pipeline of deals coming up and then just meshing that with your investors? But, you know, with Mason and I starting this fund, we have a lot of deals coming in. But, you know, we've had the conversation. We want to be cautious. We don't want to rate over raise and then make poor decisions as far as deploying just because we have to deploy. Right. And so that's why that topic is on our mind and want to bring that up to you. You've been doing well. Why don't why don't I walk uh, you, Dan and Mason, through a little short exercise and I'll help you figure out how much private money you need. How about that? Sure. All right. So let's go through it. Uh, So first of all. How many deals do you want to be able to fund? Do you know that? Uh, Several hundred. A year. So several hundred a year. So you, are you going to stay in several hundred deals a year? Well, I, I think it, it'd it be helpful to explain our model um, first of what we're doing, where uh, Dan and I are both in the land flipping space, land acquisition, sales, and development. And so some of our deals, they turn around in a seven-day period. Uh, we had that this week of it was what, buy for 111 sell for 157 in seven days uh Mm -hmm. we paid off our investor they made four percent on that we made 17 grand our deal finder made 10 grand or something like that so there's a lot of deals with a decent amount of complexity that we're managing that it could be anywhere from seven days to you know 400 days depending on the individual deal right i suppose so yeah you you all have a very very different model um, so let me just give some advice on how to think about that. The first thing you want to figure out is, and this, this applies to whether somebody is staying in a deal and flipping a single family house, or in your case, you know, land flipping. Um, what is the average amount of money? Here's where you want to start. What's the average amount of money you're going to need per deal? See, this is right? evolving. Yeah, we, we need to yeah. narrow that down. So we've gotten some killer deals submitted with much bigger price tags recently. Uh, right. Along with the, you know, buy for 40, sell for 80. I mean, shoot, we got one last month or early this month. It's at 10 million and as is appraised at 13.7. Uh, of course, we haven't done anything that big yet, but that's part of the challenge is the, how quickly we want to scale into these larger deals. Sure, and, sure. sure. Yeah. But to... to give some data to it of Dan and I have been working on compiling recent deals and in 58 recent deals, the median acquisition price was 20,264 and the median sale price was 33,750. Okay. Well, let's play with those numbers. 
So your average person, and that's, and that's some great data. By the way, I love data over drama. No drama, give me the data, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So your average purpose, purchase over the last 58 deals, you purchased that for $20,000, and you sold it for how much? Uh, 34K. And 34 those, those, Yeah, those are median, median yeah. numbers rather than average. All right. And in what period of time? So your average purchase was 20000 right? Now, are you wanting to pull any equity out of these deals, or do you just want to you want to just cover the purchase and you're good? Just cover the purchase. Yeah, cover the purchase. And in what period of time did you do those fifty eight deals? How, over what period of time? Uh, that, that's been the the last year or so. Um, okay, the last well, the, so let's let's run it. Let's run it. Let's say your model didn't change. Let's say you weren't doing a ten million dollar deal because that's you know, let, let's, that's another conversation. <laughs> that's another conversation. All right. Sure. So you, so 58 deals in the past year. So 58 deals times 20,000 purchase price. That's a million one hundred and sixty thousand. And so I want to know, here's one of my criteria. I want enough private money to cover all my deals I'm doing for 12 months. Right. I want, mm -hmm. I want to, I want to cover, I want to have enough money for 12 months because I may be sitting on a deal for 12 months, right? Before I actually and in and in and out. That's a million one sixty. You always here's another writer downer. You always want to borrow more than you think you need, right? Not borrow, excuse me, not borrow. But yes, on my deals, I do borrow more than I think I'm going to need because I always need more than I think I'm going to need, right? On every oh, deal. Yeah. And so, and Jay, that uh -huh. that total number is one point five two four eight. So one million five hundred twenty-four thousand eight hundred is the actual total number. Okay, uh, cool. So a million and a half, right? So I'd say since you get better, since everybody typically gets better at what they do, let's say you need um, not. Need, I would recommend let's get two million raised. Let's get two million in the hopper. That's more than, and that and that's given if your business doesn't grow any, right? So to get two million raised, do it in my way, you should be able to easily raise a couple of million dollars just through networking and not and not getting any money pledged from existing private lenders. Uh, that should be an easy raise within six months to twelve months to get that amount of money pledged, not borrowed, but pledged. But you know, don't go for the two million first. First, let's just go for the five hundred thousand, and then let's go for the next five hundred thousand. Because it's much easier when you're starting out. Uh, and I'm not saying you guys; I'm <laughs> saying anybody. When you're starting out and you never raised private money, it's a lot easier to get five hundred grand wrapped around your head than you know two million dollars. But now let, let's apply this little exercise. And again, I go into very detail in my brand new seven day private money challenge on how to do this. But in the world of single family houses. The way it works is first, um, you're looking at the amount of money you want to make. Then you need to know, okay, on average, what's my um, what's my average profit per deal going to be, right? What's my average profit going to be? My average profit is eighty two thousand dollars per single family house is my average. But let's say someone's listening to this show. Let's say your average is going to be anticipating. Uh, only fifty thousand dollars. And by the way, I don't want to do a deal unless I'm projecting fifty thousand dollars profit, because you guys know and I know if you project you're going to be doing a deal and you're going to be making fifty thousand dollars, you know and I know you ain't going to make fifty thousand dollars, right? Because there's going to be other stuff that comes along. So let's say your average profit is fifty thousand dollars. Well, then you look at that. You, you've already looked at how much money that you're that you're that you're desiring to make. So now you run out. Well, how many deals do I need to do a year at fifty thousand dollars profit in order to get that annual income figure? Whatever that comes up to, multiply that times or divide that rather by the number of deals that you need to do at fifty thousand dollars in order to make that amount of money. Once you see that, okay, well, here's the number of deals I need to do. Now, here is my average after repaired value. Now, for those of you that are listening to this show, if you're getting lost in what I'm saying, don't worry. 
I go over it a lot quicker in the seven-day private money challenge. But once you see what that number is, now you're going to take the those number of deals that you need to do over the next year, and now you need to know what is your average after-repaired value on houses, on single-family houses. So here's the average. What's the medium price? Just stay with first-time home buyer prices. So here's the average after-repaired value. Multiply times the average after-repaired value. Multiply that times 75% because that's how much we borrow per deal of after-repaired value. So there's your average amount of private money you need per deal. Multiply that times the number of deals you anticipate doing over the next 12 months. There's the amount of private money you need over the next 12 months in the single family house space. Again, if you got lost, don't worry about it. I, I slow it down. It's a 20 minute session, 25 minute session in one of the days on the seven day private money challenge. But did, did you get a nugget out of that, Mason or Dan, as far as how you look ahead and back into it? Yeah. Yeah. I like that. You know, realistically, we just in our own businesses, we have several million dollars deployed and it's just a matter of of moving moving that into the fund here and slowly and steadily growing with the uh the capital partner business we're closing other people's land deals with with the cash we raise um we've just started very slow and steady and i think we'll just we'll keep on that route uh but anyways no that was really insightful and i i think that's about the best way you can do it is just working backwards off what you're trying to accomplish so thanks for that jay absolutely i call backing into it you got to back into it sure. and Jay, you've you've brought it up a couple times, but what's the elevator pitch on this seven day private money challenge? Oh, in other words, what's the seven day private money challenge about? What is it? Yeah, tell. Oh, my land. So I'm so excited about this, and thank you for asking. So, um, so I've got a book, Where to Get the Money Now, um, and 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 I gave that away for for some time. You know, when I'd come on a show, but I wanted to make I wanted to make the training so much more interactive, right, uh, and consumable. So it, this is hot off the press. So I just finished recording. Uh, uh, I went to my attorney's, uh, went to my attorney's law office. But anyway, I just finished recording seven days of training. Now you talk about a master class. I mean, this is seven days of master class. But each video training is only fifteen to twenty minutes long. So in that seven days, I'm going to be sharing how to realistically raise $500,000 in private money for real estate deals over just a seven-day training period. Very consumable, very easy, you know, to understand it and digest. So I would love to offer that to your audience. You simply go to private. Excuse me, that's the wrong uh, URL. Uh, Private Money Challenge, for goodness sakes. <laughs> so it's www.privatemoneychallenge.com. Privatemoneychallenge.com. And come join me. I promise you one thing. You're going to learn how to raise private money. But we're going to have a lot of fun learning how to raise private money. So as soon as you enroll at www.privatemoneychallenge.com, you will immediately receive the very first um, 15, 20-minute training. And then the next six days at 10 a.m. Eastern time, it'll come in your email box and you'll get each training. It'll put you on the fast track to raising private money for your real estate deals. And I'd love to have you come join me, uh, anybody that's listening here to this show. Fantastic, Jay. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And we'll make sure to have privatemoneychallenge.com linked in the show notes of this episode. But getting into uh, the point you brought up, I reiterated it once. Uh, it's the value of being a capital connector, uh, being that person that's able to go raise money. And I think what you teach a lot of people is, hey, you can be that go person that goes and raises money. Do you feel like your private lenders most of them are just individuals that have a decent amount of money, or do you feel like uh, there's a lot of people that are in the private equity space or ultra high net worth individuals, which I think means over $30 million net worth? Do you target those people, or are you looking more for the doctors, attorneys, and to whomever you are tar targeting, why? 
So that's a great question, and here's why. Of the 47 private lenders that we have, did you know that not one of them had ever heard of private money before I put on my teacher hat, my private money teacher hat, and I started sharing with these people in my own connections, people I go to church with, people in the Rotary Club, people at Business Networking International, uh, people in my cell phone. I just started sharing with people uh, all the way back in 2009 what private money is, how they can earn high rates of return safely and securely, how they can use retirement funds uh, and earn unlimited money per year, either tax-deferred or tax-free. None of these 47 private lenders in my world had ever heard of private money or self-directed IRAs. I simply started sharing. So the question is, who do you see on a regular basis every week? Who do you see every week on a regular basis? You know, it's pretty funny. Private money's right under your nose. It is right under your nose. I started raising private money back in um, February of 2009, and it just never occurred to me that one of my assistants that works here in the office had a relative that didn't know what to do with their money. I hadn't even told one of my assistants that I see every day about my private money program and how I teach people how they can earn high rates of return safely and securely. So I have raised all of my private money, which is eight and a half million dollars. So, you know, I'm not raising money for, you know, I'm not raising money for huge projects. It's all single family in my case. So I have eight and a half million dollars from these 47 private lenders that we just, you know, move from project to project and use on different projects. So for Mike, so that's a good, so what that triggers is a good question. If you're listening to this show, you need to get in the seven day private money challenge to first to figure out how much private money you need, <laughs> right? For your business. And then I'll walk you through step by step. Okay. Now, how, how do I get to accomplishing, you know, that, um, did that answer the question? Yeah, no, it definitely did. And I think that it's surprising to a lot of people in this space that it it depends on who you're raising money from. Of uh, I think at the beginning for myself and for Dan, there's plenty of deals where we've given up a majority of the meat on the bones to the people that came in and provided the capital. And that is what a lot of real estate investors expect. Of they They won't do a deal unless they're doubling their money. And you forget how many people that make six, seven figures per year that a majority of their money is in a high yield savings account or in invested in index funds or bonds or uh, what, whatever it might be. And receiving an 8% annualized return is fantastic portfolio por performance, not just to the individual in investor, but to the multi-billion dollar industry that's you know within pri private equity, uh, hedge funds, venture capital, that sort of thing. Uh, so I, I think it's just a good reminder of look into your network because Dan and I together, I think we added it up recently, have raised a little over 4 million between both of us and our businesses. And it's mostly come from friends, family, and fools that uh, believe in us that uh, heard <laughs> us on a podcast or uh, we've connected to or networked in, in any capacity. But Sure. Well, they, let me ask you this question, Mason and Dan. Of your connections that you raised $4 million from, did any of them ever heard of private money, private lending, self-directed IRAs until you shared it with them? Uh, yeah. So, so, yeah. Some, I, I think that's so got more, You guys got a more sophisticated list of connections than I do. Well, I, I think the self-directed IRA thing is definitely um, a huge opportunity that many people don't think about. And having taken money from other people's self-directed IRAs into deals, it's, it's more complex than... Uh, some people realize if you don't have that connection of, you know, an appropriate custodian company type thing that uh, you mentioned kind of towards the beginning. But one, one quick, I guess, bragging question for you, you to answer, Jay, is uh, you, you've taught a lot of people how to raise money. You've raised a lot of money yourself. What's the largest individual capital contribution that either you or one of your students has received for either a deal or a fund or something like that? 
from what's the largest contribution from one private lender? From one private lender. Yeah, from one private lender, one $1,250,000. And tell us as much as you can about that private lender. What what was their career? Was it just sitting in a bank account? You know, how did how did that work? Yeah. You know, it's funny, Mason and Dan. Um some of the people that look like they're loaded with money are broke. And some people that don't look like they would have any money saved up will surprise you. So this private lender Actually, it was a, it's a husband and wife, husband and wife. They are both, are you ready? They are both retired school teachers. Retired school teachers with over a million dollars in retirement funds. They both retired uh, for after working 30 years in the public school system in one of the poorest states in the nation, namely Mississippi, and one of the lowest, um, and by the way, I got great friends in Mississippi, so nothing against Mississippi. Uh, In fact, one of my most successful real estate investors that have raised millions in private money since working with me live in Mississippi, Poplarville, Mississippi, to be exact. Uh, My wife's from Mississippi, so... uh... You know, shout right. out to Mississippi. I said my wife is from Mississippi. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, and they live in Pottersville, Mississippi. They got to drive 30 minutes to get eggs and milk and bread uh, from Pottersville, Mississippi. But here's the, here's the takeaway story. They taught school in Mississippi for 30 years. They've been have they've been they hadn't touched their retirement money either one of them in 30 years, and now they're retired. Or now, and then they were retired. I mean, they've been doing, they've been funding my deals for years, and they didn't know what to do with the money. So they were visiting here in Moorhead City, North Carolina, at church. So they were visiting a family. In fact, their son was my tile guy, Gordon. He was my tile guy, putting in tile. And so they're visiting at church. And uh, so we we go to lunch together, and so we're eating fried chicken and barbecue at Smithfield's Fried Chicken Barbecue Joint after Sunday uh, church, and we're eating there together, and we're chatting along, and and I looked at uh, the gentleman, and I said, "Um, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard of self-directed IRAs? That's the way I started the conversation, not started the conversation, but started the conversation about private money. I said, have you ever heard of several guys? Because I knew they had just retired. I knew they had just retired. By the way, I teach new real estate, I teach real estate investors how to raise capital for the real estate deals. And the first step out of five steps that I cover in the private money challenge, uh, the first step in five steps is make your list of potential private lenders that are in your cell phone. And I say the first people on your list should be retired people because there's a good chance retired people have got retirement funds. And I promise you, if they got retirement funds, there's a good chance they are not happy today re- regarding where they've got those funds. So I'm eating fried chicken and barbecue. And I said, have you ever heard of self directed IRAs? I promise you, when you ask that question to the average person on the street, they have not heard of self-directed IRAs. And he said, no. And so I started a conversation about what self directed IRAs are and how people can use their retirement funds um, and get really, really insane high rates of return, either tax-deferred or tax-free. So that conversation led to them being a private lender that the relationship grew to $1,250,000. And it all started with meeting them at church, they were visiting, we went to lunch together, and I asked the simple question, by the way, have you ever heard of self-directed IRAs? That's a great question to ask anybody that's retired. Yeah, that that story really uh, answers an upcoming question I had and illustrates how to go about this very well. One of the first people to ever invest with me was very similar. It was just someone I knew at the gym and my brother went to the same gym and said, did you ask so-and-so uh, if she wanted to invest? I know she's got money sitting around and doesn't know what to do with it. Uh, and so 
that's that's a very similar story and to what you said earlier about oh it sounds like you guys have more sophisticated investors well the problem with that is there are people who know the business better and often are looking for higher returns and the best investors from my experience are the ones that have money but are not sophisticated in how to multiply the money and so they're perfectly happy with a high single digit return if they don't have to do anything whereas if you talk to mason and i in 10 20 years somewhere older versions of ourselves we know how to go multiply money at a massive rate so we're not going to lend anything unless it's a huge return so i think that's actually an advantage jay um but you partially answered what i wanted to ask you here next kind of as we move towards the end of the conversation here uh you mentioned as far as sourcing private investors just people in your network that you talk to every day retirees I, busy doctors, accountants, engineers, these are all good options. But you host a podcast. Uh, I know you do a lot. You're very active on social media. What have you found to be the most uh, productive source of marketing that ultimately leads to to you finding more private lenders? A podcast, some the book you wrote, something else you're doing? So that's a great question. Here's the fastest way that I know to scale raising private money. Share your stories on social media and just share what are you doing in your business. Uh, like in my business, they love they love looking at rehabs. They looking at they love looking at befores. They look they love looking at afters. And here's the story. Here's here's the specific story. Specific actionable item to get money chasing you. By the way, in this world of private money, we don't chase, we don't beg, we don't sell, we don't persuade. I've never even asked anybody for money. They're they're chasing me, they're going to chase you. So you do a deal. You do one of them land deals. You do one of them land deals, right? Or you do a single family house deal or what you know, what you know, self storage, whatever whatever it is you're into. You go on your cell, you go on your social media Post a picture of the property. Post a picture of the deal you did. And and you just post in the comments say, I'm so excited about this deal I just did. Bought it for X. I mean, give them the dollars. Give them the dollars. I bought it for X. I sold it for X. And my private lender or my investor made X. Here's the call to action. And the SEC don't care. Here's the call to action. Want to talk money? DM me. That's it. Want to talk money? Don't tell about some kind of percentage rate that you're paying or nothing than that. You're just giving the bottom line facts. Hey, I'm so excited about this deal I just did. There's the picture of it on your social media or Instagram or whatever it is. And say, I bought this for X. I sold it for X. And my investor made X exclamation mark hey want to talk money direct message me jay that's great right there and i think uh you did a great job which don't take legal advice from jay dan or myself contact your own attorney but uh it's uh if if you use the wrong language in that sentence that's not um indicating if the sec will get involved it's when they're going to get involved with you uh, because it sounds like you're selling securities if you phrase it wrong but what jay's saying right there is all you're doing is sharing your wins and offering people an opportunity to chat about money there's nothing wrong about that and i think sharing your successes as well as sharing your failures uh, assuming you learn something um is very powerful on social media and that's part of the reason we've created this podcast and have platforms that we try to share what we've learned uh, on how to do deals versus not do deals. But Jay, as we move towards the very end of this show at the top of the hour, is there anything you wish we had asked that we didn't? And is there anything you want to leave our audience with? Yes. I wish you had asked me about my podcast. And since you didn't, I'll tell them about it. So my <laughs> we did we did actually talk about it at the beginning of the show because you guys were on my podcast. So um Again, if you're looking to raise private money, you can follow me and easily find me uh, on whatever podcast platform you watch or listen to, rather, whether it's, you know, iTunes or it's uh, Spotify. It, I'm, I'm all over the place. So the name of my show on podcast is, believe it or not, Raising Private Money. 
So if you just type in, search for Raising Private Money, uh, you'll see it pop right up, Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. And I have amazing guests. Twice a week, we release it on early Monday mornings and early Thursday uh, Thursday mornings as well. And I have amazing guests, such as Mason and Dan, that join me on the show. And I interview other people about how they go about raising private money. In fact, if you want to learn how Mason and Dan raise private money, you can come listen to the episode uh, uh, over at Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. And I interviewed them about how they go about raising private money. So, yeah, that's it. Mason and Dan, um, I don't know about you guys, but this has been fun for me. Thank you so much for having me on. And one more time, uh, you want to raise private money? Um, Come join me on the seven-day private money challenge at www.privatemoneychallenge.com. That was fantastic. And you can hear Jay's sign-off podcast voice. Um, go check out his podcast, and I have both been interviewed on it. We'll make sure to have all of the relevant links that we spoke about today in our show notes. But this is Mason McDonald with Dan Haberkoss and the Big Picture Blueprint signing off. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's j-c-o-n-n-e-r.com slash money guide. And download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Conner.